Bone Health, Diet and Nutrition by Mark Lorenzato for VideoHealthGuide.com. The simple strategy is to follow the Paleo Legacy Model of Nutrition to diagnose and treat any inflammatory processes, to know your medication side effects, review each one for its effect with your health practitioner, and schedule screenings for bone density. Dietary concerns can be addressed by following a paleo legacy diet, which means avoiding starch, sugar in excess, sodium, and refined oils in excess. This is drastically limiting these three things, sugar, sodium, and refined oils, relative to the general population. Also, supplementing as needed is part of our paleo model. These include supplementations for essential oils, the omega-3s, DHA, and EPA, essential amino acid-derived molecules, carnitine, creatine, carnosine, and choline, and stay in an anabolic, a muscle-building state to maintain good bones. Foods that are high in calcium can be very beneficial, bok choy, broccoli, kale, sardines, soy milk, and others. There's also supplemented calcium foods. And one should limit excessive protein intake. High protein diets that are not managed with vegetables to neutralize the acidic content of the urine can be problematic, meaning that protein supplementation can actually cause bone loss by affecting the acidity of your urine. Acidic urines contribute to bone loss. Caffeine intake up to 400 milligrams a day is well tolerated. This is usually two or three cups of coffee or the equivalent in many teas. The source of calcium does count. It's not just calcium, meaning that calcium is retained with alkaline urine. Therefore, vegetables are beneficial. Starches and proteins can cause acidic urine. Anti-nutrients such as oxalate and phytic acid combine calcium, zinc, iron in foods, particularly if the foods are not cooked, leading to low calcium absorption. And lysine, which is an essential amino acid playing a role in calcium absorption, is low in many vegetarian diets because lysine is low in cereal, and many vegetarians have excessive cereal in their diets. Let's look at carbohydrates. Sugars, can be monosaturated single sugar molecules or linked together in two sugar molecules, disaturide or many polysaturides, and starch, where the sugar molecule polymer goes on and on and on. They are carbohydrates because they are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So not all carbohydrates are damaging. Carbohydrates that are not absorbed before the colon are termed fiber. Therefore, most sugars, polysaturides, and starch, if cooked, are rapidly absorbed and flood the liver. They glycate or bond sugar to enzymes and fats throughout your system, causing problems. Hemoglobin A1c is an example of glycation. So when a person has an elevated hemoglobin A1c, they have elevated glycation. Sucrose is the common table sugar. It is a disaturide, meaning it is made of fructose and glucose molecules. High fructose corn sweeteners are a very common sweetener in our industrial age. Sucrose is pretty much equal, equally damaging, unfortunately, no matter whether it's cane sugar, brown sugar, organic sugar. In a sense, sugar is sugar. Maltose dextrin, dextrin, amylodextrin, modified starch, oligosaturides are all terms for sugar because when these are hydrolyzed, they become glucose, the main sugar currency of our body. And sugar alcohols are frequently used because they taste sweet and can be substituted for other sugars. They're less damaging in general than glucose, sucrose, and fructose, but they also have some liabilities. So where's the starch? This non-fiber food, this food that absorbed in the small intestine, it's found in rice, it's found in flour, whether it's whole wheat or white, whether the rice is brown or white. It's found in many cereals, meaning quinoa and th other cereals like this will also be high in starch. You can go to Wikipedia and look at the content. 
Breakfast cereals, despite the advertising saying they're good at lowering cholesterol, for instance, are full of starch, flooding your liver with glucose. Potatoes in the United States is the most common source of starch, I believe. Many similar tubers either have starch, either are starch laden or rapidly convert to sugars. Inulin, which is a fructose polymer, is found in some foods. It has some good benefits in terms of limiting your uh, glycation, but it also has the same problem of flooding your system with sugar with low density of minerals and vitamins, causing many problems. And there are many names for sugars or the polymers of it in processed foods. So why should we greatly limit starch? Well, first of all, the paleo, our paleo legacy, our inherited pattern of eating over hundreds of thousands of years, we didn't have starch. You have to cook food to get the starch out of it. And you can imagine a progression where we learned to malt food, to leave it in water over time and let it break down and in some sunlight how this would break down more rapidly, ferment some of it, malt of it. So there was clearly some usage of it. But energy without molecules to manage it, to manage that energy is damaging. And starch is just this. It is a refinement of whole cells. It takes not just the contents of the cells, it takes out a storage molecule within those cells and therefore it is devoid or low in vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. Whether the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants are fat soluble or water soluble does have an effect. Prior to agriculture and industrial agriculture, food came with these essential nutrients in the right amounts. With the ability to grow specific crops and refine them, we've deviated. Sugar and starch issues. The production of de novo fatty acids or fatty acids that are made in the liver after a starchy meal or a starchy input into the stomach and small intestine, the liver is flooded with glucose making new fat. These are packaged in lipoproteins, the molecules that carry fat, but if the lipoproteins are predominantly from de novo fat from starch, they're very low on fat soluble antioxidants. Therefore, when they deliver energy to cells in the form of fat, the energy is without the maintenance molecule needed to burn this fat. A flood of glucose in the form of sugar from starch causes glycation or the bonding of glucose, which is now in the bloodstream, onto all kinds of molecules, particularly enzymes. Glycation is damaging in itself. And refined sugars and starch deplete water-soluble vitamins as well as the fat-soluble vitamins. When we add folate back in, there can be problems in the utilization of the folate because enzymatically, biochemically, we are not all the same. And the repeated depletion of antioxidants and fat-soluble vitamins is inflammatory and damaging to bone, as you'll see in the video on inflammation. <clears throat> to accelerate healing with targeted nutrition, I recommend some supplementation, particularly vitamin D3. Unless you're getting adequate ultraviolet B radiation from the sunlight, this is the high-end spectra, non-visible spectra. So here in Northern California, I supplement and recommend all my patients supplement from September to May. And in the summer, if they're not getting ultraviolet B radiation, if they're not getting out playing, then also supplement in the summer months, or if they're using sunscreen. The Paleo Legacy diet with an, uh, suggests we have to have an anabolic or a protein building amount of food to build muscle and good bone. If you're vegetarian, there are some su substantial liabilities Perhaps you are having too much starch from cereal and not having enough lysine, which is very much of a problem. Likely you're diminished in your polypeptides found in meat or the amino acid derived molecules in meat. L-carnitine, which is essential for transporting fat. L-carnosine, which has aspects of detoxif detoxification and stabilizing mus muscle pH or muscle acidity. Creatine, which supplies an energy store, one of the energy stores of the body, and choline, which is critical in your membrane management. Conjugated linoleic acids can be supplemented, but the supplements are different than what you'll find in nature. 
in nature, these are found in meats of ruminants. For instance, deer, wild game, also cattle. DHA and EPA were in meat in our paleo legacy, and now we get them through algae-derived means. You can get them as a vegetarian in a algae-derived formula for DHA. Vitamin B12 is found only in the animal kingdom. It's found in eggs, but it's not found in vegetables or cereals. DHEA supplementation is not part of our paleo legacy and is, we'll address this in the video on supplementation. And vitamin K2 is critical as the vitamin D3 in bone strength and in making sure that the calcification moves into bone as opposed to soft tissue. It also was probably mostly from game meat prior to civilization. And one should avoid excess vitamin A. They're also it's worth knowing if you supplement with general vitamins, which vitamins can be detrimental in excessive amounts. So supplements within Paleo Legacy, L-carnitine, 500 milligrams twice a day. Osteoblast, the bone building cells are stimulated to increase bone strength through the hormone osteocalcin via L-carnitine. As I mentioned, DHA, DHEA is not a paleo legacy issue. It can be looked at uh, as well. Calcium is a paleo legacy issue. We probably had higher calcium content in our diet, mostly because we did not consume cereals, which are particularly low on calcium. Calcium in the diet can come from many foods, but also as a supplement from calcium carbonate um, with magnesium to avoid constipation or calcium citrate or citrate with malate if a person's taking an H2 blocker or PPI causing their stomach acidity to be low. There are other forms of calcium. The calcium phosphate ratio is an issue. Avoiding cereals will allow you to have a normal calcium phosphate ratio in general. And the absorption of fat soluble antioxidants in food can be augmented by adding alpha lipoic acid to the diet or tocopherols or, or uh, vitamin E's and the omega 3's. Berberine also is not a paleo legacy issue, but it can help stabilize lower glycation and help in insulin resistance. It is a supplement. So there are diseases affecting bone health that require focus. One is postmenopausal state osteoporosis, for which DHA may be added as well as other things. Thyroid illness can cause problems, particularly if taking L-carnitine. Diabetes and diabetic states increase your risk of osteoporosis, and we need to have greater vigilance of watching starch to avoid the development of diabetes. Also consider the berberine, as I said. Fatty liver is something that will promote osteoporosis and it can be avoided by avoiding de novo fatty acid synthesis, avoiding alcohol and avoiding starch. Decreased in saturated fat intake, particularly in the dairy products, cheeses, uh, for instance. And supplementing with L-carnitine can be a benefit in fatty liver as well. Metabolic syndrome, particularly this is elevated blood pressure, tendency to atherosclerotic disease, and a tendency to insulin resistance or diabetes with other complicating factors are all generally due to too much starch in the diet, too much sodium in the diet, too much refined oils in the diet, and not supplementing with our paleo legacy supplements. Alcoholism and starchism, as I said, are very da damaging and need to be addressed as the main issue if, those, if that's the case. And kidney failure will contribute to bone loss without question uh, through vitamin K frequently as well as vitamin D deficiencies and other problems. Celiac disease or any inflammatory bowel disease through the inflammatory process will contribute to uh, osteoporosis and there are other diseases as well. These all need to be discussed with your health practitioner. I bring them up here to facilitate better dialogue. Key points. Diets high in oxidative stress contribute to both heart disease and osteoporosis. Poor diets in this way cause both things. This can be from a diet high in fat and low in fat soluble antioxidants and fat soluble vitamins. Diets high in starch, sugar, and refined oils need to be avoided. Dairy should be considered a refined oil within some contexts. When oils are concentrated from plants by pressing or chemical extraction, fat-soluble antioxidants and fat-soluble vitamins are frequently depleted, causing loss of the vital maintenance molecules. Look for underlying disease. If it's recognized, 
make an efficient strategy for managing it. And follow screening recommendations, the DEX or DEXA scan, uh, are minimal x-ray radiation and very beneficial tests. Simple strategy, do the right thing nutritionally, paleo legacy, supplement as needed, control underlying inflammatory process, know your medications, discuss each one with the health practitioner. Certain ones are very damaging. You can watch the video on this. And different strategies to prevent osteoporosis depend upon your state of progression. Avoiding bone fracture can be critical. Um, limiting the likelihood of a fall, increased exercise to increase your bone density with supplementation over time can be very beneficial as well. Dietary measures, paleo legacy, supplement, calcium rich foods, limit excessive protein intake, no protein supplementation, just good protein intake, caffeine limitation for several cups a day, and know your sources of calcium in food. We're in the information era. Thank you. This is Dr. Mark Lorenzato. There are other videos discussing other aspects of osteoporosis management and good bone health.